I think people underestimate that the, the, the ramification of the speed of communication and, and the effect upon people's psyches. And I think what, mm -hmm. what we play with, we play a lot with fire in terms of confidence. And we don't necessarily know where that threshold is, that tipping point in confidence. And the fact that communication speaks so quickly, um, yeah. the tipping point of confidence can happen much faster, I think, than people realize uh, today. So that that is concerning to me. I think we underestimate um, yeah. the, damage, the damage that is done globally with the speed of communications. Is the West losing control of the silver price, of the gold price? We're going to talk about that and much more with today's guest, James Anderson from SD Bullion. James, welcome to Ron's Basement. Ron, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to meet you and to be on your channel. Yeah, well, you you follow the silver and gold market very closely, uh, working for SD Bullion. And when you look at what's going on in the world, is it just me, or is the does it feel like the West is starting to lose control of the silver price, possibly the gold price as well? Yeah, you you really have to define losing control, right? I and mean, that's a that's a that's a pretty ambiguous term, and a lot of people like to. Mm -hmm without that uh, to get clicks and to get in, you know, to get people interested and to get people excited. Uh, yeah. It's definitely turned. The worm's turned. It's been obviously turned because gold had broken out beyond the 2000 level. And now 2000 is not resistance. It's becomes long-term support. Uh, and this has been going on and building the consolidation over the last four, four years, roughly. Uh, it's obviously broken out on gold. Gold typically leads and silver generally follows. And there's been a lot of excitement lately because silver is showing of late that it's starting to follow gold, right? And so it, mm -hmm. it's understandable that people are super excited. I think the idea that, um, that China is, is behind it, India is behind it. Yeah, physically they are, they're the, they're the, they're the Davids in, in, in the system. I mean, not the, the, they're the Davids in the derivative system, but they're the Goliaths in the physical system, right? And so mm -hmm. you have this, this pull and tug between the two, right? Whereas the spot price generally, in general, is found by derivatives. Uh, but there are times where physical has to be gotten. And the only way to get physical is for spot price to go up, right? And, and so that's where we're at. We're at this point now where the push and pull that's been going on for the last three, four years in consolidating prices is starting to go to the upside. And that's 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 yanking the, the spot prices higher. And so when I look at the derivatives notionally in trading, I, I think of it more on a historical level, on a, on a basis of... What has happened in prior financial uh, history in, in terms of derivative markets, especially when there was outsized derivatives trading around a fixed physical supply? And that history is really, really interesting and long. I mean, there's, there's some interesting uh, things that have occurred. But, but in the end, I think people underestimate the fact that they think that derivatives with high leverage are used to suppress gold and silver values. And that has been true pretty much since the 1980s through the 2020s. That has been true generally, but there are times where that stuff, where it blows back in faces and spot prices climb walls because short squeezes occur. And there have been times in history where short squeezes occur and that's when you get exponential prices. And a lot of times people bring up, you know, oh, the exponential price in 1980, that was a bubble. Well, it depends on how you define a bubble. There was so much fiat currency out there that that was a bubble. And the gold was basically calling it into account. And I think we're, we're walking into another era where that's going to occur, but not just in the Western world like 1980. This one's happening globally. Yeah, the, the world is changing. I know um, I like to, to reference the, uh, you know, the meetings that happened between Chinese President Xi and Vladimir Putin when, when they were leaving each other and they both agreed that the world is changing like no other time in history. And I want to get your perspective on this. It, it feels like, um, you know, due to, uh, let's say, poor fiscal and monetary decisions by our leaders in Washington, <clears throat> excuse me, that the United States finds itself in a position right now uh, with all the debt and the growing deficits, that, that we need the world to need our dollars more than ever. But it's all happening at a time when the rest of the world, the BRICS and the BRICS plus countries, are telling us uh, that they don't want our dollars. That it's it's kind of a confluence of events that, uh, and, and, and what we're seeing by their actions uh, is that what they want uh, is gold. Uh, and, and I'm hearing even out of China that they're stockpiling large amounts of silver and copper as well. I mean, are we... Are, 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 
Yeah. 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 We almost forgot. I'm, we're going to talk about India, James, because I and you're the guy that to me broke one of the people that broke that story. But are we at this point where, um, you know, I, I guess we we all suffer from normalcy bias or recency bias, uh, where we think, well, it you know the big national debt and the fact that you know the the de-dollarization hasn't been a problem yet. But do you think it will become a big problem? Yeah, it's going to become a problem so so badly that that the that the fiat powers that be in the United States are going to have to change policy in the way that banking is done, and that's mm -hmm. already occurring. I mean, you start to see announcements in the last uh, few weeks. The SWIFT system, which is basically the underpinning of all yeah. uh, massive amounts of uh, of payments system, it basically the entire world's payment system, the SWIFT system, announced we're going to have CBDC system in twelve to twenty four months. Uh, you had last week BIS uh, coming out with, I'm talking about big central banks, not the Eastern one, yeah. I'm talking Federal Reserve, Bank of England, uh, the Bank of France, which is essentially the European EU bank. Uh, all the major banks in the Western world are now saying, yeah, we're going to we're gonna start our little sandbox here in the CBDC world, which is basically code for, yeah, we're coming as well. I mean, it, you know, people like to say it's experimental. It says it in the, you know, the press release, but experimental means see in a couple of years and it'll be real. Um, so, yeah, they know the system is changing and there's going to be major implications for that. You have a bond bear market that you're staring at for the next decade or two. Uh, what, what, what are we going to do to finance this, uh, this extreme amount of debt that we're, we're piling upon, as well as the unfunded liability uh, yeah. notional that's out there, which the U.S. Treasury just last this, this, just early this year, um, at the end of 2023, Janie Yellen signed the report. Um, the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid net present value looking out 75 years, the net present value today is $175.3 trillion. Okay, so that, that's not, not just the $35 trillion in hard U.S. debt that's already sitting there. I'm talking about another $175 that the Treasury admits is out there in the lifetime of young, young children and babies in the United States, right? So, yep. you know, you could put your hand up in the wind and think, well, are those kids going to put up with that? Are they going to, like, what kind of political trouble are we going to be running into the next few decades as people fight over this? Because a lot of people are going to say, hold on now, I don't want to buy the U.S. debt because the, they're mandating us to do so, because that's essentially what's going to right. happen. They're going to start nationalizing the banks, requiring full, you know, banks to be buying all this, all, all, all these uh, debt, debt issuances as well. And so they'll create a system probably where they'll, your interest rates will get you maybe halfway like you know another, another repression financial repression where great your interest rates 10 percent, but the true price inflation is 20 every year on year on year on year on year on year you know that's yeah. that's basically the system that they're trying to create yeah first mining gold is a development company advancing two of the largest gold projects in canada spring pole in ontario and du parquet located in quebec each already has five million ounces of gold reserves but exploration initiatives are underway at both projects to find even more gold. First Mining is well financed, has zero debt, and owns an interest in four additional Canadian gold development projects. You know, and I and I and I like to point out, uh, I'm not an economist. I'm, I have a degree in accounting, and and I don't claim to to have any uh, any any extraordinary insight into this, but. You know, we hear so much about, oh, the Fed's got to lower rates. The Fed, especially in the silver and gold community, all this talk, well, the gold and silver are doing well because the Fed's lowering rates. And and I, I kind of argue that, the, number one, the Fed doesn't have to lower rates for the uh, silver and gold, real value of silver and gold to do well, that eventually, uh, it, it based upon almost exactly what you just said, eventually what's really going to drive the price, and I think over history uh, that, that's been the case as well, what's really going to drive the price is inflation because of, you know, because of a devalued dollar, because there's no other way to fix what's going on outside of, in some form, devaluing the dollar. And when that inflation uh, really kicks in and, and people start to wake up, I mean, people in the West aren't, uh, haven't woken up yet. I mean, you have, I have, and, and I think probably our viewer who's with us now have, but, but, you know, 95, 97% of the people don't really realize what's going on. And when they do, it could be too late. So what you're describing is confidence eroding as time goes along, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. we're, we're talking about where, where's that tipping point? That tipping yeah. point is, is something that's very concerning. 
And that's essentially why they want to create a system where they can clamp down things, right? Because that right. tipping point is coming. And they're going to try and use technology to help clamp down the velocity of currency and the turnover of currency so it doesn't get out of control and hyperinflate your face. And I'm sure that's exactly what they want. And they probably also have a button for hyperinflation as well. They need to just reset the table. You know, I mean, like you right. can actually argue that they may in induce it just to reset the table, right? That's that's how silly and crazy and perverse this entire thing is getting. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, people in the Western world are, are still clueless. They think the price inflation mm -hmm. was big. That's nothing compared to what's probably going to come uh, in terms of some of the the, the, the price inflation that we're going to see in the future. Um, yeah. You know, you have Larry Summers coming out and admitting the fact that in 2020, you know, the, the, if yeah. we had used the old metric for CPI, we were probably running, you know, low 20 percent price inflation year on year. And that's probably true. That's probably what mm -hmm. we were looking at. <clears throat> Anybody knows that in the United States. But I think most people, they understand that, but they don't understand that that's going to become the norm in, in, in the future, I think. I think that's going to become much more the norm because like we've discussed, there's just too much debt. There's too many unfunded liabilities. The only way to pay that uh, and, and to continue to juice the economy, which is a consumer economy, is to keep nominal price up, keep nominal prices high, keep everyone in this dream and thinking that the old times will come back. We just cut rates, et cetera, et cetera. But no, we're getting yeah. toward, the, toward a change in the system, a change in the power structure of the world. So, so this is a different game. This is not 1980 with Paul Volcker and, and low debt loads and, I can jack up interest rates for a year or two and we'll get through it. And then we'll fiat financialize the world and jam, you know, treasuries around the world and get everybody hooked on our dollar. Um, yeah. That's coming undone. That's unraveling as we discussed. So in that unraveling, there's going to be a lot of change. And yeah, of course, we're, we're in for times ahead that are going to be turbulent that we've never seen. No, no. And you, you, you mentioned something earlier about confidence. But what really gets me about the Fed in Jerome Powell is when did the Fed stop becoming a bank and become more of a public relations firm? And to me, um, you know, I say that somewhat facetiously, but, um, you know, the Fed, uh, you know, with their meetings and then all the speeches that the governors give, it feels like to me, they become more of a of a public relations firm, and uh, and 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 I think that's maybe uh, symbolic of the fact that um, that what they're trying to support is 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 nothing fiat paper, whatever you want to call it, paper money. Yeah, you're describing one half of the of the, of the absurdity of it. The other half of the absurdity of it is the New York Federal Reserve, uh, what they're up to. I mean, they're basically juggling i don't know how many balloons in the air, right <laughs> yeah I mean, every right. day they're just intervening in every damn market you could ever think of they even have a trading desk over in the seabot over in chicago uh yeah. you know, probably doing stuff in, in in the commodities markets as well so we don't know exactly like i, I you would have to have a full-time position and, and be studying that to even have a guess as to all the things they're jamming their their fingers into I mean, yeah. how many people are employed at the New York Federal Reserve? It's probably thousands of people involved in everyday management of the system to keep it, you know, running as smoothly as possible, right? So, yeah, right. You have a combination of, of whisperers talking about all types of things. And I don't know how many ways out of their mouths they're talking in five different directions. You hear one Fed head say something the, the day that contradicts the other. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, it's absurd, right? So yeah. so, yeah, I mean, that's that's what you're living in. You're living in a system, it's basically where it's like, nothing makes sense. You know, it, it, it yeah. doesn't make much sense. It's like, where are we going? Because I know there's a wall ahead. We're going to run into a wall at some point. I could see the math on on my calculator. This takes no sense, <laughs> right? So, yeah, you're, you're left in this position of being in the middle of a fog. And, and it's and the, the train is going faster and faster and it's being and it's becoming more absurd. And you just, yeah. you know, it's, it's not <laughs> it, it's not settling. It's it, it's definitely unsettling the situation that we're in. No, no, you guys like you and I, you know, we're in a stressful world. We're like digging in and and uh and and discovering what's really going on. I mean, you know, most people, most of my neighbors. Uh, wonderful people. I like them all, but they're asleep, right? They have no, they have no clue as to what's going on. You used a great word to describe the system, a, a word that I, you know, I guess I think it's great because I use it often as well, perverted. It's the best word I can come up with uh, to describe kind of how our financial uh, mon monetary, mostly system, fiscal as well, but monetary, it's become very perverted. And uh, escalated that now, you know, as you described, as we're getting further, deeper and deeper in the hole, right? As the, 
as the uh, doom spiral or debt spiral, whatever you want to call it, it begins to increase, right? I mean, if you, you know, as the interest payments, everything just starts to feed on itself, that it's become very escalated that, and that in the things are, have, do, you, do you agree that events will continue to happen um, on a more frequent basis uh, as we get toward, you know, the wall that you, that you described? Yeah, I, I think if you think the 2020 to 24 era was crazy, uh, my suggestion is the 24 to 2030 era is going to be every bit as right. And yeah. I suggest that you, you got to strap in because it's going to get crazier and crazier. And just the fact that the way that technology and communication happens these days, yeah, you get to watch it in real time all over yeah. the world. Right. And that's, that's the other part of it that I don't think people, I think people underestimate that the, the, the ramification of the speed of communication and, and the effect upon people's psyches. And I think what, mm -hmm. what we play with, we play a lot with fire in terms of confidence. And we don't necessarily know where that threshold is, that tipping point in confidence. And the fact that communication speaks so quickly, um, yeah. the tipping point of confidence can happen much faster, I think, than people realize uh, today. So that that is concerning to me. I think we underestimate um, yeah. the, damage, the damage that is done globally with the speed of communications. Yeah, wow. I appreciate you bringing that up because uh, while I may have known that, the, the way that you communicated it uh, really drove it home, right? We can communicate so much more quickly. I mean, even if we look back just a year ago at the, uh, you know, the little quote unquote banking crisis, which was what, three out of the four biggest banks uh, in the history of the country that failed, that that information spread very quickly. And I know it, it presented problems for the banking industry because, uh, you know, bank runs 30 years ago or 100 years ago, everybody had to go line up at the bank, right, and ask for their money. Uh, in 2024, a bank run could, could you know, literally happen in an hour yeah, because of te technology. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, we could, I mean, you and I in the time that we've spent here could have both drained our bank accounts and bought, you know, uh, I'm sure, you, you know, hundreds of monster boxes of Silver right. Eagles, right? Um, but that same thing, James, how, how do you think that th that same concept could apply to the silver and gold market? Because we did see that a year ago, right? That when when this banking crisis hit and, and, and all, suddenly everyone became interested in silver and I guess gold as well, that we saw a rush of buyers, like same thing. You, that if somebody wants to buy silver and gold in today's uh, day and age, they don't have to drive to the local coin shop and wait in that line that we heard about. They can couple clicks of the mouse, like you just said, that it can all happen so much more they can go to sd bullion they can go to pimba whoever you know and and, and that the inventory can get cleared out rather quickly i think people take for granted the the size of the inventory that's available uh, for delivery at any moment in time in the north american markets yeah. uh, that, that is a small layer of the actual amount of physical gold and silver that people are keeping in deep storage you know and mm -hmm. in terms of they're not selling it that it's not for offer it's mom yeah. right yeah. And so you're talking about a very thin layer that presents itself every day that people assume is going to be there when the time hits and it's, oh, I'm scared and I should take this currency out of this bank account and I should put it in bullion, right? Mm -hmm. When that happens on a decent scale, on a decent sized scale, bullion's unobtainium. Bullion's unobtainium, then all of a sudden you get ridiculous premiums, massive delivery delays, anything in size, good luck, uh, you know, in terms of getting it. So... That, that's going to come again. It's inevitable. Yeah. Right? You've seen, you know, the 2020, 2021, 2022 era. Those are previews. The 2008 financial crisis, those are previews. I think ultimately we're, we're moving into a situation where there's going to be an era or a time frame where bullion premiums are going to make, make those areas look silly. And you're going to have a situation where you won't be able to get bullion at, at any reasonable yeah. price. You're, you're going you're to gonna see the world get forced into derivatives and into risky mining bets. Because there's no way you can get bullion because it's it's basically unobtainium and very difficult to find. Or if you can get it, it's going to be very expensive. If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices quality, and service. I think Pembex is best, and you will too. 
and be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's Basement. What I've been noticing uh, with the silver and gold markets, the silver and gold price, that um, a lot of longstanding relationships, uh, things that we've been taught, right, or things that we've heard over and over for the last few years in particular, that these relationships are starting to break down. And it, it feels like to me that silver and gold, and I can't think of another way to say this, are calling BS on a lot of these long-term relationships. Things like this idea that the dollar, right, the DXY index has to go down for silver and gold to go up. Well, the DXY index has been holding pretty steady uh, around 104, 105 last I checked. And I think we safe to say that the gold and silver price have been going up. The Fed has to lower rates for silver and gold to go up. Um, even on Friday, we had this unbelievable, James, I'm sure that uh, you're like me, you know, you're just in awe of the of Bidenomics and how great, I'm being facetious, how great sure. this economy is. 300,000 jobs. Six months or a year ago, that type of news would have uh, destroyed the silver and gold price. Yet we 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 got an opposite reaction. Our our silver and gold um, in a new paradigm, for lack of a better term. And well, are they? This is this has always been the paradigm. If you go back in time and you look at some of the people who were there in the '60s, warning this was going to happen, and it played out in the '70s and '80s, like John Exter. If you've yeah. ever looked at his inverse pyramid that he oh, drew, yeah. I believe in 1968, and there's been people who've made like a modern era look inversion of that. I did that personally for SD Bullion in the, in the gold and silver guide that we created on, on our website. But but basically, it's an inverse pyramid of the way finance works. And when there's a spillover event where there's real fear, where everyone essentially is saying, "I want my money back, I want my investments back, I want my capital back," it all folds down an inverse pyramid. At the very bottom of that is bullion. And second to that, at the moment, given the system that we're in, it's domi it's dollar do it dominated, no doubt. Travel around the world, the dollar still dominates, and it's still relatively strong. We're pretty lucky at yeah. that time. <laughs> those two strengthen when we go into those types of events. And the bond market is telling you, you know, the rates going up that, hey, you know, the rates aren't high enough, and, and obviously there's not enough buyers, and we're moving into a secular bear market for bonds, so much so that we've covered in this interview that they're going to force you to buy the bond. That's essentially yeah. what they're going to be having. That's what's going to happen. They're going to start mandating you and banks to buy the bonds, right? And that's going to come at some point. It's inevitable, just given the math. Uh, so, yeah, we have a situation now where this idea that, you know, the DXY, which way it moves. Yeah, there is correlation, but there's times where they both go up. Gold can go up and DXY can go up and silver can go up. It's just tagging along and following gold. Uh, you mm -hmm. can have a situation, you know, obviously gold is going to, the, the relatively relativity between like how they how they perform gold versus silver that's almost like a 99 percent correlation i mean if yeah. gold is going to lead and get ahead for a little bit there's a be a lag and now silver starts to follow up and we're sitting still at a silly gold silver ratio of what 84 i think mm -hmm. uh, we started the 2008 you know bailout you know qe fiasco around 89 and, and that shot down to 34 within about two and a half years so 84 is not a bad spot to be, but remember, we had that silly out, the crazy thing that happened in COVID at 120. And generally yeah. in commodity markets, when you have something go crazy to the upside, like a 120 GSR, you're going to have something absolutely crazy on the other side that's going to do something nuttier. So that idea that 34 in 2011, that low, was the lowest you're going to see in your lifetime is not true. But I think to me, yeah. that conservatively, you can see a GSR before this mania goes goes absolutely crazy. I mean, I would think it would peak in the 20s, maybe even the teens, if things get really nutty, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, but this is a long-term thing. This is going to be, we're talking about through this decade, even. it can go into mm -hmm. the 2030s. Uh, you know, we're talking about not tomorrow, n not next year. I I'm oh, come on, James. We wanted it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone buying and holding bullion, I think, knows this. Anyone savvy who's, yeah. who's been in the market long enough, this is a long game play, right? And so that, yeah. I just want to make sure people understand that this is not, I know it's exciting that spots moving around. It feels like the worms turn in terms of day-to-day -day performance and month-to-month -month performance. And I think that is true. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but looking out is what I really try to focus on because what I want is people who are buying, who are doing it today, who are new into this, uh, into this market to understand the game that we're playing. This game yeah. that we're playing is not a game for a year or two trade. This is not the old, you know, early 2000s bubble era or even the 2020 COVID Reddit, you know, squeeze silliness. We're talking about a game for all the chips where we have to change the rules, right? And in that yeah. kind of 
game you want to keep a certain section of your liquid net worth off the table in a place that's always been safe and proven and private. So that, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like to uh, describe my investments in, in precious metals as I look at them as generational. I've never sold, and, I, and I'm a silver guy, I've never sold an ounce of silver. Uh, never, right? Well, would I in the future or convert it maybe at some point? Well, if we get to that, you know, uh, 18 gold to silver ratio, and I can convert maybe part of it into another real asset, maybe rental, whatever I may sure. consider it. But to yeah. me, uh, to me, it's a general, I, I, that's what I try to convey to people. This is a it, it w w when I buy silver, I like to think that I that I, I don't buy it thinking, oh, I may, may need to liquidate this in two years to buy a car or whatever. I I use the money that I feel like I feel good about my children and grandchildren someday inheriting. Um, and you know, like I said, if if uh, if we get a a mania type event, uh, sure, um, nothing wrong with converting some of it to other to other real assets. Yeah, so basically we're thinking like Indians uh, have thought about ah. gold and silver for the last thousand, two thousand years because they've gone through, I don't know, maybe a hundred or two hundred fiat currency failures throughout the last Yeah, right. You know? So <laughs> China the same way. So essentially we have not done that in the West in a long time, especially in the United States. And, you know, all it takes is two or three generations to pass to forget all the all the things that have happened in the past. So, you know, what yeah. the thing about history is that we repeat a lot of the follies of our of our history that we never learned. So uh, right. yeah, you have the right attitude, I think. And, and I think the West yeah. is going to it's going to keep building that attitude. I think it's time goes on. Yeah, I, I read something about India a couple of months ago that I found interesting, and that is that it's very common for grandparents in India to tell their grandchildren to advise them that it's a good idea to own their body weight in silver and to own as much gold as you possibly can. And I kind of joked around and did a little calculation about how much it's, you know, there's what, 1.4 billion people in India. Uh, that's uh, There's not enough silver to go around uh, to, to, to cover all that. No. Um, if you did the math on the available three nine fine silver in the world versus the population, it's less than an ounce uh, per human being. So, uh, no, yeah. you, an ounce of silver is not your body weight. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a right. not work. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're probably on in general a little thinner than we are here in America, but they're not that thin. Um, what about the seventy million? Uh, ounces of silver that India imported in February. I found that astounding. I know you reported on it. Um, when, when I just compare that to the annual mining output, uh, it, it approaches 10% I have for one country. I think it's one it's, month. It's, it's yeah, insane. one month. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely insane. And so I, you, you have to look at that number and think, what is going on there? Like, so you have to <laughs> dig deeper. You just don't say, Look at that. India is buying all this silver. There has to be something. And, and you know, I got to give credit to Pickaxe. They did a lot of research on this ahead of time. And I've been reading his newsletter a bit. Yeah. And I looked at it, I looked at some of the stuff that he uncovered. And yeah, it, 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 it's true. You have a situation where a lot of that silver, a lot of times gets said Indians are buying it for jewelry and store value purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Uh, but when you dig into the numbers, you find that about half of that month's haul was probably jewelry and, and investment uh related but the other half was was probably related to battery uh to a battery and technology play that's happening in india where if you look at the different associates that are involved with uh with, with this uh battery uh and, and this battery manufacturing facility that's opening that month basically yeah. you can tell that what they've done is they've gone out and gotten silver in large quantity because they can see the price is going to go up they may as well get as much as they can now before all of a sudden. I mean, if you're if you're building a factory, you're going to want to make sure you have the inputs. Otherwise, you could be really in trouble if you don't have the, the proper inputs for your for your doohickeys, whatever you're making, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's obvious that India is not only doing massive imports of silver. It's just regularly because the Indian people buy silver. A lot of farmers buy it as a way to to save their their capital right. over, over farming season, etc. But but it's obviously now becoming an industrial input because India, I mean, India is going to be a powerhouse uh, in terms yeah. of, in terms of a, com a country that's going to that's going to get more and more important and have more and more production and, and sway in the world in the coming decades. And you know, this is just an obvious tell that that's where the trend's going. So, yeah, that, yeah. that amount of silver is 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 crazy. I mean, seventy million. Yeah. 
one month. Yeah, and at some point, it's just like that the analogy of being in the train. We're going to hit a wall physically as well. Where, where <laughs> the just in time silver market of this idea that you can just, you know, demand yeah. delivery of massive amounts of silver is just not going to be there. So spot price has to go up to start to entice some some silver to come out for perhaps to be refined and recycled or to start building mines and, and doing the work again that's required to actually dig this stuff out of the ground, which has been, you know, not happening for the last few decades. So we're mm-hmm. running into a situation, like I said, where we're going to have an issue not only on the investment side for physical bullion, but certainly on the industrial side. It's going to be real problems. I mean, there's, it's not just me, but we're going to run into a shortage era with silver. And, and in order to, to help that shortage area, you have to have spot price go up. Fortuna Silver Mines is a global intermediate gold and silver producer. Since 2005, Fortuna's best-in-class management has delivered impressive growth and profits. Fortuna's solid financial position and operational expertise allows for performance in any precious metals price cycle and provides a foundation from which to harvest great profits in more favorable metals markets. Investing in Fortuna is an investment in quality, long-term, sustainable production of in-demand precious and base metals. To me, it's just astounding when I think about 1.4 1.4 billion people in India, and their economy is growing quickly. Their middle class is expanding like crazy. 1.4 billion, 1.4 billion people in China. So that's 2.8 billion people. That's like what nine, eight or nine times the population of the United States. And all those people, there. You touched on this earlier. Culturally, they they have a much different level of appreciation for precious metals. And obviously their governments do as well. Uh, One final, final question for you, James, because you touched on this in your most recent video. Um, Why does nobody talk about Japan? (laughs) Japan is one of the largest uh, economies in the world. I know in your most recent video, you talked about, I think the silver price in Japan had reached an all time high in yen. Um, and I, I remember reading three or four months ago that gold had reached an all time high, uh, in, in, uh, in Japanese yen. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, I w- I'll ask you to touch on the silver price news, but, um, do you ever pick up on that? Like we don't, like we never, we talk about China, we talk about, India, we talk about Russia, uh, but but Japan gets it's for as large as they are, kind of uh, pushed off to the side a little bit. Yeah, and the yen carry trade in the 1990s, 2000s was a huge uh, tool used to fiat financialize the world. Right, I'm pretty mm-hmm. convinced when you look at the uh, at the amount of silver depression in, in price, it's like you look at it and you think, was the yen carry trade used to help suppress commodity values? It's just insane, yeah. right. I mean. I pull those long-term charts out because you see, oh, wow, the price of gold is now twice what it was in 1980 in Japan, almost twice, right? And yeah. the price of silver is still a third, roughly, of what it was in the 1980 high, even though it's passing its 2011 high, right? So, mm-hmm. so you know, for me, when I look at that, it just it's just comforting to know, like, I, silver is dirt cheap until I see the price yeah. of silver twice the price of its 1980 high in the end. Uh, I'm not going to be thinking about, is this a silver bubble or anything like that, right? Right. So it's just, it's it's comforting to know like how dirt cheap silver truly is. Um, in Japan, Japan is interesting. I mean, there's so much history involved with the Japan and the United States relations. And some of it goes way back to like World War II and prior to World War II when they're, when they're, when they're attempt at being, a, you know, an, an empire failed. And, and they, you know, I don't think people realize uh, we're not taught this in the West. I think that we made a tacit agreement almost when, when they surrendered that we wouldn't even talk about it all that much. But I mean, Japan in 1937 went into the capital of China and, and the, it's called the Rape of Nanjing. People don't really talk about it in the West. But if you go look up, it's one of the most gruesome things that happened in the 20th century during the World War II era. I mean, it, you're talking about a couple months campaign of raping and pillaging throughout their entire capital. Uh, you know, that's like walking into Beijing, essentially and doing the same thing now. Right. And in mm-hmm. that campaign, they, they went and they lifted 6,600 metric tons of gold from China. Uh, ah. Not only that, they killed, you know, 200,000 people and took photos of people's heads getting lobbed off, et cetera. So like like absolute savagery. Right. And mm-hmm. so 6,600 metric tons of gold, that's like three fourths of what the U.S. 
that's more than three fourths of what the U.S. even claims to have today, right? And so right. that 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 still exists. China can press that button anytime they want to have their citizens get angry about J Japan and, and and think about all the payback that's still required for that. And what happened to that gold is a mystery. You know, this is a, and, and it's a it's a good conspiracy to rabbit hole to go run down if you like. Um, but I mean, it, and then you look at the J Japanese amount of industry industrial demand for silver from the 1980s for the electronics that they used. Yeah, 1990s. I mean. If you're in Japan, buying silver bullion is virtually impossible to do. You can ask people who live in Japan. It's very hard to get. You can find gold. You can find platinum. But they don't really market silver in bullion capacity because they need it for industrial use. They don't need silver for you to go hoard in your, your house. They, they need mm -hmm. it for their inputs in the electronics they create. So, yeah. look, I have a lot of respect for Japanese culture. And it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge market. And, and, it's, and, it's a, and it's a very interesting culture, a very interesting place. I would like to go visit. It's probably a good time to go. Go visit uh, Tokyo. I would think it's probably a good price, uh, but but yes, no one talks about it. But in the end, like look at the long term charts. The yen is a major, very important uh, fiat currency in the world, and so so you know keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on the price of gold and silver in the yuan. Keep an eye on prices of gold and silver in the pound. In, in you know in in the dollar, of course, as well. But those things are important. It's not just the dollar. You need to think a little bit bigger in terms of, you know, the United States is what population wise, one twentieth of the world and mm -hmm. GDP wise, you know, one what, less than one fifth. It, it's there's a world out there. We're not the only ones in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to point out to, to our viewers uh, that you put out a video every week and um, it's one of my go to favorite videos to watch. And that's on the SD Bullion YouTube channel. Is that correct? Yeah, it's typically done on Friday, uh, early evening. I like to get out as early as possible, but sometimes there's a lot of work to, to pull it out because what I what I like to do is I go through the week's uh, information in terms of news and stuff, and I try to aggregate what's most important and boil it down to something that's 10, 20 minute stops. Uh, and so regular viewers can kind of keep up to date with what's happening and really the most pertinent, most important stuff with a long-term view, of course. I'm not, I'm not, we're not there talking about, oh, what's going to happen on Monday in the spot, right? We're there talking about, uh, you know, next year or two or a decade or two. I mean, we're talking about a longer-term uh, timeline. So appreciate you letting your viewers know. And yeah, it's on SD Boy YouTube channel. Yeah, I, I will, and, I, and I'll just be honest, um, uh, I always get one or two great things out of your video uh, that it, I then use and some the things that it uh, good ideas of in terms of things to talk about. Uh, sure. You're not just repeating the news. You're you're adding a um, kind of a unique angle and a very insightful angle, and and you get me thinking. Uh, it really is one of my favorite videos to watch every week. I mean, probably um, I like to watch Andrew McGuire on Live from the Vault uh, when I can as well. His perspective is is a little more different, but your your ability to kind of distill the top weekly stories, but then add a uh, a, a great angle to things uh, is, is something that I find very, very valuable. So I'll put a link to your channel in our description. Uh, James, this has been great. I'm, uh, I'm going to bug you in another six or eight weeks and see if I can get you back on here. Uh, thank you. And on behalf of our viewer, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Great, Ron. Thanks for having me.